Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Genesis Energy stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Genesis is an oil and gas midstream company. Midstream refers to points in the oil production process that falls between upstream and downstream. Midstream activities include the storage, processing, and transportation of petroleum. Let's get started with the model. This company has a small market cap, $579 million. That's the value of the company according to the stock market, and they trade at $4.72 a share, and they have 123 million shares outstanding. If you want to calculate shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price. That gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow equals cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are investments in property, plant, and equipment. If a company has positive free cash flow, it has the ability to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. And this company has a big negative in 2016, but it has positive free cash flow in the following three years. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And this company also has one year of negative net income. It's in 2018 though, and they have three years of positive net income. Revenue is a sales and their revenue goes up quite a bit from 2016 to 2018 but then it drops in 2019. This seems to be a trend with a lot of oil and gas midstream companies where the revenue is driven up and then comes down. Probably has a lot to do with oil prices. Their margins are pretty low and fairly steady except for 2018. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. The higher your expenses, the lower your net income, the lower your net profit margin. And in 2019, this company converted 4% of its revenue into profit. The other 96% went towards expenses. Let's look at the financial statements to see why they have these two negatives. Of the four years, only in 2016 they had negative free cash flow. Free cash flow is cash flow from operations, which is 298 million, minus investments and capital expenditures. That's 463 million. So it's pretty obvious they had their biggest capital expenditure year in 2016. They invested almost half a billion dollars in CapEx. The other years it was much lower between 160 and 250 million. So that investment brought down their free cash flow that year. CapEx are investments in property, plant, and equipment. The entire amount is recorded in the cash flow from investing section in the year the asset was purchased. CapEx is capitalized, which means it is recorded as an asset on the balance sheet. It is depreciated over its useful life, so each year part of the value of the asset is deducted from the balance sheet and passed through onto the income statement as an expense. So it does bring down your net income each year. CapEx is generally considered a positive thing since the company is investing in their operation to grow it. When analyzing a company, you should consider two factors. Will this item provide the company with a good return on investment? And what is the opportunity cost? Meaning, would the company be better off if the cash was used for something else? And in 2016, they had the highest net income. And that is the year they had negative free cash flow. Another thing that stood out to me was this negative and change in working capital. So as you know, to calculate free cash flow, you take cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Now to calculate cash flow from operations, you start with net income, then you add back the non-cash items from the income statement. You also adjust for working capital. Working capital are changes in accounts receivable, accounts payable, inventory, things like that. When a company uses accounts receivable, it is shipping a product to a customer but not receiving payment. It is selling on credit. Accounts receivable negatively affects cash flow. So in 2016, they sold $9.9 million on credit. 
In 2017, they sold even more on credit, 140 million. But when the customer does pay for their merchandise, the cash flow comes in and accounts receivable goes the other direction. It's a cash inflow. In 2018, they had a $130 million cash inflow from accounts receivable. When a company buys inventory, that also negatively affects cash flow. Many companies have gone out of business due to poor inventory management. In 2016, they had a negative $54 million of inventory, so they were stocking up on inventory. It looks like they did a good job in future years of selling off that inventory because they had an inflow of $49 million the following year, then $20 million, then $7 million. When a company uses accounts payable, it is improving cash flow because it receives a product but does not pay for it. So in 2016, they had negative $25 million of accounts payable because they had to pay for a product they received in the past. But in 2017, they had a positive $106 million. So it looks like they purchased on credit. So they received the product but didn't pay for it. So the cash stays with this company until they pay it later on, which it looks like they did the following year in 2018. Financial statements are like a puzzle. There's so many aspects to it and you can't look at one year. You have to look at multiple years. In 2018, they had negative 12 million of net income, yet positive free cash flow. Let's look at the income statement. The top line of the income statement is annual revenue, 2.9 billion in 2018. Below that is cost of revenue, 2.6 billion. That includes all the direct costs the company spent in order to generate its revenue. Examples are payroll for the workers on the front line and material expenses like computer chips for a tech company or leather for a shoemaker. Gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue. That's 321 million. It is good to look at every number on the income statement as a percent of revenue to see if the company is becoming more or less efficient. Operating expenses of $62 million. Operating expenses are the costs not directly tied to making the products. Examples are marketing expenses and payroll for support functions like accounting and human resources. Operating income is gross profit minus operating expenses. If a company has negative operating profit for a long stretch of time, it will eventually go out of business. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. That's $229 million. You want to make sure that number is less than operating income, else the company may need to take on more debt just to run its day-to-day -day operations. Below that is other, and this line item is here because some companies generate money or lose money outside of its main day-to-day -day business. Examples are when a company writes down the value of its assets. Another example is when a company sells part of its business. What brought down their net income in 2018 was this $126 million impairment. They did have a $42 million gain on PP&E, so the net was a negative $84 million. You can only get so much information from Yahoo Finance, so this is from their 10K, and it mentions the $126 million impairment. And that's made up of three things, a $23 million goodwill impairment, an $82 million asset impairment, and a write down of $21 million on its assets. Goodwill can only occur when a company acquires another company for more than it's worth. To give you an example, say you acquired company X for $10 million and say the value of company X is $7 million. The way you would know it was worth $7 million is because the assets minus liabilities equal $7 million. Once the acquisition is complete, you would move all of company X's assets and liabilities onto your balance sheet. Remember, the assets minus liabilities equal $7 million, but you paid $10 million. You have to plug $3 million into the asset goodwill to accurately reflect the $10 million acquisition price. Every year following the acquisition, you have to test for goodwill impairment. That means you have to figure out what the value of company X is currently worth. Next year, if you deduce the value of company X is $9 million, you would have to reduce your goodwill from 10 million to 9 million and also pass through a $1 million loss onto the income statement. The $1 million will bring down your net income but does not affect cash since the cash occurred when you acquired the company last year. An asset is impaired if its market value is less than the value on a balance sheet. Assets that are impaired are accounts receivable, goodwill, fixed assets, plus many more. The balance sheet is a snapshot representing what the company owns and owes. So the numbers should be as accurate as possible. If the numbers are overstated, it can be misleading for investors. 
To give you an example, say you purchased a building last year for $10 million. And this year, the value of the building was $6 million due to a really weak real estate market. You would have to reduce the value of the building on the balance sheet from $10 million to $6 million. You would also have to pass through a $4 million loss onto the income statement. This is a non-cash item for this year's financials because you paid for the building last year and the cash was reflected in last year's financials. Since this is a non-cash item, you would have to add back the $4 million on the cash flow from operations section of the cash flow statement. The result of this impairment reduces your net income, which reduces your earnings per share, giving you a worse P.E. ratio. It also reduces the assets on your balance sheet. This impairment may negatively affect several ratios and metrics. So the $126 million impairment brought down their net income in 2018. It brought it down to negative. Now let's go to the cash flow statement. So the 2018 cash flow from operations, it starts with net income, negative 11 million. Then it adds back the non-cash items from the income statement. Depreciation and amortization are a common non-cash item you add back, 313 million. Here's the $126 million asset impairment. So it added it back to free cash flow. So that's why your free cash flow is positive that year. Let's look at the capital structure of the company. $3.4 billion of debt, $2.2 billion of equity. The interest rate they pay in their debt is 6.09%. This company doesn't pay taxes because it's an MLP, Master Limited Partnership. To qualify, the business must receive 90% of its revenue from natural resources or real estate. This company receives its revenue from natural resources. An MLP issues units instead of shares. So the weight of debt is 61%, so they're a little leveraged. I prefer to invest in companies with less than 50% debt. That means they have 39% equity. Cost of equity is 21.21%. To calculate cost of equity, we use the capital asset pricing model. Part of the CAPM formula is the beta. They have a really high beta, 2.46. Beta is a measure of a stock's volatility in relation to the overall market. The S&P 500 has a beta of one. This stock has a beta of 2.46. So if the S&P goes up 1%, this stock should go up on average 2.46%. And if the S&P goes down 1%, this stock should go down about 2.5%. Beta is calculated using regression analysis. Regression analysis allows you to examine the relationship between two or more variables. Beta is systematic risk related to the market like interest rate changes, policy changes, wars, etc. Systematic risk cannot be diversified away. Unsystematic risk is the risk of an individual company which can be diversified away by adding more stocks to your portfolio. And their WAC is 12% which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. The WAC is a discount rate companies use when they want to take on new projects. For example, if a new project came along that cost this company $1 million up front and the project would generate $100,000 of profit each year for the next 20 years, the company would discount those 20 years of cash flows back to today's dollars using the WAC. If the present value of the future cash flows equaled $1.4 million, the company would take on the project since it cost them $1 million they would make a $400,000 profit. But if the present value of the 20 years of cash flows equaled $800,000, then the company would not take on a project since it cost them $1 million. They would be losing $200,000. You only wanna take on projects that add value to the company. The WAC is a discount rate we are going to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 1.7 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.1 billion. We divide that by 123 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of $17.42. They're trading at 472, so they're trading at a really deep discount, 73% discount. So it's a strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is even higher. They're at 2277. Simply Wall Street's value is based off of the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. The stock peaked about $40 five years ago, but has been coming down quite a bit. So even if a company doesn't have good financials, it doesn't mean the stock is always overvalued. 
it's a based off of where the stock is trading. If the stock price comes down far enough, it will eventually be a good value. For several years, they were paying a pretty good dividend between 50 and 70 cents per share per quarter, but it's dropped quite a bit. They're probably trying to conserve cash through the pandemic. They're only at 15 cents a share. But since the stock price has come down so much, their dividend yield is almost 13%. Dividend yield is annual dividend over stock price. So if the stock price goes up, the dividend yield goes down. And if the stock price goes down, the dividend yield goes up. It is good to remember that a company's financial performance is not 100% correlated to the stock price. It can help or hurt the stock price. The only thing that is directly correlated to the stock price is supply and demand of the market. The stock price will go up if more people want to buy a stock. The stock price will go down if more people want to sell a stock. It is possible for a company to report great financials and its stock price keeps going down. It is also possible for a company to report weak financials and its stock price keeps going up. The market is forward thinking. Part of investing in the market is understanding market sentiment and investor psychology, which can be the hardest thing to figure out. Let's look at the financial ratios. They have amazing price multiples because their stock price has come down so much, it makes these ratios look great. The median P.E. for the entire market is 16, the average is 17.8. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15, there are 5.8. So investors are paying $5.80 for $1 of earnings. The median price of sales is 2.0, the average is 4.7. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 0.2, so investors are paying 20 cents for $1 revenue. Price to book, the median is 2.3, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, they're at 0.3, so investors are paying 30 cents for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. They have a weak interest coverage ratio. The median is 4.0, the average is 12.9. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense, so they can just cover their interest payments. They don't have much left over to pay dividends. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, also called operating income on the income statement. They have a low ROE. The median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, they're only at 5%. So they don't provide a good value to the equity holders. Current ratio is really good. The median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2. They're at 1.4, so they can cover their current liabilities. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash, accounts receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on 29 oil and gas midstream companies. Genesis is right here. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. The average is down here. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So price to earnings, price to sales, and price to book, they're doing much better than the average. So that's good to see. They're doing well in current ratio at 1.4. They're not doing well in ROE, 5%, but the average is pretty low as well, 8%. They're a little lower in debt at 61%, average is 63%. Their market cap is much lower than the average at half a billion, average is 9.5 billion. They do pay a higher dividend than average, almost 13%, average is almost 12%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a deep discount. Their ratios look pretty good and their financials are okay. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.